It's Saturday evening. It's time to talk about the very best comic books in the world that you can read this week. And we've got a bevy of them, a lot of indie books once again with our good friend Drew. How are you doing, Drew? Doing great, Wes. Yeah, it was a solid week. Not as heavy as last week, but still a very solid week for good books. Absolutely. Once again, fronted by any books, although I will give this out there. A lot of these are miniseries and a lot of them are coming to the end. So we might end up being uh, in a bad time, a little bit of a hurtful time after this because they haven't launched a lot of new stuff lately that's been really intriguing. Yeah, it's gonna, I'm expecting a very contracted uh, winter at this point. Uh, granted, I mean, like, we know there's a lot of there's a lot of big event books coming out. But do we honestly see ourselves recommending these big event books? No, not at, not at all. But so it'll be an interesting winter. We'll see what happens there. But for now, we still got the good stuff. First up, Conan Battle of the Blackstone, number one, Jim Zub writing, Yoda's Sheriff on Art. And this is a crossover event within the Robert E. Howard kind of universe. And I do think calling it Conan Battle of the Blackstone is probably a bit of a misnomer. Certainly you get plenty of Conan, but you're also getting Solomon Kane. You're getting L. Borak. We're getting like an author in here. We're getting several characters being attracted to this Blackstone sigil that's been throughout space and time that's all leading them to this one event that was really interesting. There's some amazing images from Yona Sharp, especially when Conan comes on to the pics and it's like on the mountain and you see people like being strewn up and everything. And there's a lot to like about this comic book. It's definitely a table setter and it's moving to bigger things, but I definitely recommend this one. Yeah, absolutely. I recommend this all day, every day. Yeah, this is a solid uh, opening chapter to a big event crossover and uh, it, establishing different characters and different players and their uh, interactions with the Blackstone. And uh, you, we get to see what his interactions with Conan, what it did to Conan mentally, just pretty much turned him into an unhinged beast at one point in the book. But uh, what's interesting is we see what happened to El Borak. El Borak, we're introduced to him in the Savage Sword of Conan uh, magazine. And we, uh, we see, we see him turn from a very, he, uh, he's a, known as a very, like an Indiana Jones, very confident uh, adventurer. But when he, when he finds out about this later on, it's about 10, 15, 20 years after that story, you see him, he gets swelled up. He starts sweating. He gets nervous. He gets, he's scared of this stone. I love Solomon Cain's his brief is to the point. And it's just like, yeah, it's like, it goes against God. Got to take this out. Love it. And uh, yeah, this is a fantastic opening chapter. And uh, we, we get a Howard's, we get a, um, more or less a Robert E. Howard stand-in author, I think. And uh, I'm very curious to see what happens on that end of the story. But yeah, this is a terrific opening chapter, and I cannot wait for the next one. Yeah, I definitely noticed that the author himself, like the time period that they give for him is like the year that uh, Robert E. Howard died. I wonder if they're going to tie that kind of into there. He definitely looked like him. That was cool stuff. We got another really cool number one, Prairie Gods number one, Shane Connery Volk, writing and illustrating. You might remember that name from Nottingham, which we've been basically recommending for two or three years at this point. That series just ended. This is also from Mad Cave. And if you like really cool cars and you want to see really cool car chase scenes and races and stuff like that with GTOs and other muscle cars, this is the comic book for you. This has the best car chase scene in a comic book since Batman White Knight. I believe it's issue number five. Really, really like this stuff. And he's also setting up some lore and some things that are going on there with some mysteries that I think are going to play out later on. And it was really fun. Very, very dark stuff. Really cool. Yeah, I agree. I completely, thoroughly enjoyed this issue. Uh, uh, I know Max, Kyle, and I, we were uh, granted access to this book early on, like I think like very early on. We got to read this. We had a blast reading it. We finally got to talk about it. I love the beginning, the middle, the end of this. The whole way through, I got a smile on my face at the very end of it. I'm like, of course this character would want to go again. It makes sense. Uh, but yeah, the, the, tr the car chases in this are absolutely beautiful. And I'm going to say something bold right now. I think Honestly, I think he's illustrating car chases better than Sean Gordon Murphy. There. I said it. And his cars are just as beautiful as his. And I love how he draws the muscle cars here. Uh, and I cannot wait for the next chapter. Sean, uh, yeah, uh, Shane Connery Volk, he's, he is, this as a, as a opening chapter for him and his writing duties, he, he did a fantastic job. And I cannot wait for the second chapter. Absolutely. That was definitely a surprise. Didn't even realize it was coming out, but I was very excited to read that one. And it definitely lived up to the Shane Connery Volk vibes when it comes to art. But this time he's doing cars. We've also got Rook Exodus number five, Jeff Johns writing, Jason Fabok on art. You get an awesome cover on this one where you have Rook basically strung up as like a scarecrow and all these crows are feeding on him. This is a different take on Rook Exodus. 
you know, it's been a lot of uh, action scenes and going out and doing stuff. This is much more introspective in Rook kind of coming to terms with his relationship with his crows and why he's less successful than other people and what he's going to have to do to actually be able to go out there and fight Ursa, who has basically dispatched him at this point. And it looks like we're going to be having a big battle next issue. Fantastic stuff here. Jason Fabok completely owns it on this one. I believe this is the best cover of the series so far. This is, is a fantastic cover. It's very visually striking, and uh, it's what you want. And as well as for the story, yeah, I, I loved it. It's a very much more introspective story into the character Rook. We get to see his backstory, like what it was like on Earth, you know, with his uh, with his father. Did he or did not? Did he not do these acts intentionally? Were that was were they an accident? Got to read to find out. And yeah, like you said, we find out why he has a problem communicating with uh, the the ravens and the birds. And uh, yeah, he, he realizes what he has to do to himself, you know, to um, establish that trust with the birds and it's fantastic. I love it. And like you said, the art in this Jason Fabok absolutely kills it. Yeah. W- once again, um, for me, it with um, ghost machine, it's a tie between Rook, e- Rook Exodus and uh, um, red coat. The- these two are the two of the best right now. Yeah. Do check out Rook Exodus guys. Fantastic issue. I don't think it's a tie. Rook Exodus is definitely number one in my book, but everyone has a different taste, but definitely check that one out. Absolutely. Fantastic stuff. We've also got uncanny Valley. Number five, Tony Fleek's writing, Dave Walker on art. And it's as fun as you might imagine to where you have a little boy. His grandpa was a cartoon. His mother's half cartoon. And apparently his blood has power in it. And it wants to be taken by like an evil sorcerer who's been using and manipulating people. And everything is kind of coming to a head in this issue. People might start dying. And the young boy might have to go to desperate measures by the end of this. And we do see Pecos Pete, his grandpa, have to come to terms with the fact that he's been duped and he put his grandson in harm's way. Yeah, this was a fantastic issue. There was a lot about this issue that really reminded me of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, a lot of elements, uh, because the main villain character, he really reminds me of the judge. And I do like that aspect because he's a very, very threatening character, very menacing character, and has a strong presence like the character in this book does. And there's a certain plot device in this that really re- kind of reminds me of the soup from Who Framed Roger Rabbit and what it, what it can do to these characters. I, I do like it. It's a little more simple. A little more cleaner, but it's the same um, end game with it. But uh, yeah, I do love its setup here. I I do love the uh, I, I just I love the pacing. It's just you know you the you don't know what's going to happen. I'm legitimately in con- concerned for the son, for the mother. What's going to happen? Are they going to survive? And uh, yeah, and actually, it has a very very surprising ending. And I'm very very curious to see where it goes in the in the next chapter. Yeah, this is a very surprising read, guys. You guys do have to check this out if you love things like Looney Tunes, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, you know, uh, early Disney cartoons, you you will really enjoy this series. It is fantastic. Absolutely. Be looking out for that one. I think there's one issue left before that one's over. Another series we've been talking about since its inception, and this is the end of the road, Dawn Runner number five, Ram B writing Evan Cagle on art. I like it, and I think reading it with the other four issues will make it even better. And I must admit, I'm not Completely aware of exactly what happened by the end of this, but there's a lot of really cool elements to it. We have some loose ends that do get tied up in the reemergence of Anita at the end of this. How it happens, I'm not really sure, but I don't think we're supposed to know. Yes, I agree. I, I'm glad you said that because I'm like, I'm reading it. I'm like, I I think I know what, wait, wait, what are they saying? I, I think I get what he's saying. But yeah, just effectively, I think more or less a rebirth at the end of the book. She becomes something else or becomes reborn. And uh, yeah, I do like what they said. And not just that, I mean, the art in this is absolutely beautiful. And I cannot wait to see more of this artist. He is fantastic. Every page in this is beautifully nasty and graphic. And just all the monsters look beautifully horrible. I, I, I love it. It is incredibly detailed. And I can't begin to imagine how long it takes this guy to do a page on a book because it, it's is so incredibly beautiful. Um, yeah, do check this book out, guys. It's very interesting. It's a uh, Pacific Rim with a twist. You know, um, yeah, it, it, this is a, a fun read. Ram V actually did a solid job here from uh, beginning to end. And I think he did get the landing, and it's Ram V, so it's going to be a little bit more, you know, a little bit more of a higher concept type of thing. Definitely going to enjoy it even more on the second or third reading. We've also got Canto, A Place Like Home, number four, David Vuher writing Drew Zucker on art. I've been following the adventures of Kanto since the very first issue. Really love this series. We're heading to the end of the road, and we're kind of putting all the pieces in place. They're coming in a new car. Canna, you got the Shrouded Man and his army. You've got Kanto, 
and the other 10 men and the, the allies that they formed over time. And uh, I will give Booher and Zucker this. You know, this is an all ages comic book. It's mostly intended for children, but they are not afraid to kill off characters. And we do get a major character death in this one. They do add some elements to the beginning of it that I think are supposed to make the death more meaningful, but I don't think it completely works because you never saw it before until this issue, but it's still very, very good. Yeah, and you said this is an all-ages book, but it really reminds me of uh, something like the Black Cauldron that Disney did back in the late 80s, where, yeah, it was for kids, but it was a very dark story. And yeah, this is a dark story. You know, and Like you said, there's deaths in this that I didn't expect to happen. And uh, I got to applaud them for that, for going down this path, you know, with, with a story like this for all ages. And yeah, it takes a skilled author to do something like that. And the art in this is absolutely beautiful. I'm very, very curious to see what happens next because the ending we're left with, I'm like, wait, wait, what? I'm having, I had to flip back and forth, back and forth uh, with what happened. Wait, did, did I follow this right? Did I miss something? Uh, yeah, it's it's good. Um, yeah, uh, if you guys haven't given all age books a shot, do check out Canto. It is clearly one of the best, if not the best, all age books. Definitely been enjoying that one for several years. Really appreciate what Drew Zucker has been able to do on the art there. Hopefully he's got bigger and better things planned out in the future. Our final indie comic book recommendation, Flash Gordon number two, Jeremy Adams writing, Will Conrad on art. The first issue was basically like a jolt to the system. You didn't know exactly what was going on here. You get your bearings a lot more in Flash Gordon number two as you have Flash as well as this new ally in Planet Death, which is this enormous prison that you cannot escape from. But they are not the only ones there as they're kind of traversing through the jail, trying to find their way out. They find out Ming is in this prison as well, and he may have to team up with Flash Gordon if they're to escape this thing alive. Fantastic stuff there. Great adventure, very pulpy atmosphere to it. And the Will Conrad art, I absolutely love it. And the, the costume on Flash Gordon absolutely kicks so much ass, it's not even funny. Yeah, Flash Gordon looks like such a badass in this in this book. I, I, it's amazing. Yeah, Will Conrad is is, fan, is a fantastic artist. I hope he stays on this for the long run. It's not some Marvel deal where he's done after three, four, five issues and then they call it quits. Stay on here, man. We need some consistency, please. Uh, yeah, I love the pacing of this book. It's very uh, enthralling. It's very, and I wouldn't say it's action heavy, but just uh, it's very uh, exhilarating. You know, because you want to see because it's they're trying to escape, escape from his prison. So you want to know if they're going to make it out of this alive. And like you said, Flash may run across a certain uh, former villain. Ming. And yeah, making a deal with the devil with them. We'll see if does he? Does he not? Got ready to find out. And yeah, it's kind of like a there's a lot of vibes in this I got from like a, the uh, Superman Warlord series the, 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 when he was a prisoner on a war world, like fighting the, as a gladiator. So I think we're making some elements of that in this book coming up. And I, I look forward to reading that. It's going to be a blast. Yeah, guys, do check out Flash Gordon. If you haven't read Flash Gordon, if you think it sounds corny, it's cheesy, no. It is uh, Jeremy Adams, Will Conrad are kicking ass on this book. First two issues are solid. Uh, this is a solid pulp story, solid character. You will have fun reading this. Absolutely. And there was a Flash Gordon Corley book out this week, and it's perfectly fine for what it is, but it's like multiversal Flash Gordon with like different iterations of him that have nothing to do with this Flash Gordon. I think it's a little bit too early to be expanding their horizons to that degree. But you might like that if you like anthologies and different twists on the character. But he wasn't quite right for the best of the week show. Moving over to Marvel, we've got one book to recommend. Get Fury number five, Garth Enos writing, Jason Burroughs on art. Absolutely awesome issue here. We finally get to Nick Fury in the Hanoi Hilton. Frank Castle gets to him. And when you see him, you will not recognize him. And when you see his hands, especially you will realize this man has been through literal hell on earth, being in prison there and interrogated and all the things that they likely did to him. The, the stuff with Nick Fury is that you can't look away from it because of the way that he's acting and the look in his eyes and that scene in the back seat of that truck and everything. And it's absolutely insane what happened to Nick Fury in this book. And Jason Burroughs with the art really goes for it in two scenes, especially where he's like, fuck it, I'm not holding back. We're going to make this thing pretty darn graphic. And it's a, a real winner, an enormous step up from issue number four, which was a little too exposition heavy for me. Yeah, issue four was, I would say, very exposition heavy. And I really got to the point where I was thinking, you know what, maybe this would have worked better as a novel than a comic book. Because clearly, you love hearing these uh, CIA agents talk. I don't care for these two CIA agents. It's like, Garth, that, those, may, those two guys may be your boys, but I, I don't give a shit for these guys. I'm here for Frank Castle, and I'm here for uh, Nick Fury. 
That's what I'm here for. And uh, in this issue, yeah, it's very, very shocking when you open this up and we finally get the big reveal of what happened to Nick. You see that that big splash page of him. It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> and uh, it's just not good. It's, beautiful. it's beautifully horrific. Jason Burroughs has done a great job in this. So, yeah, he really, he's channeling a lot of Steve Dillon and his art in this book. And I dig that a lot. I love Steve Dillon and it's really coming out in this and it's a great welcoming presence in here. And uh, yeah, where it goes to by the end of this, whew, whew, you guys better hold on. If you, like, if you thought issue four was boring, like we all did, read issue five. You're going to love this one. It, it really gets to where, where it should be going. It's right back on track. Absolutely. That's been a real winner for Marvel Comics, at least in my book. Unfortunately, almost everything Marvel's doing that's good right now is a mini series, but that's the topic for another day. The final comic book that we will recommend from DC Comics, The Boy Wonder, number five, Junie Ball, writing and illustrating. This is also a miniseries, and this is the final issue of that. You know, we've gotten the issue uh, fleshing out the Damian Wayne Nightwing relationship, the Damian Wayne Red Hood relationship, the Damian Wayne Tim Drake relationship, the Damian Wayne Talia Al Ghul relationship to get to this moment where he's finally confronting his grandfather, Ray's Al Ghul, with his brothers beside him and his father in his corner kind of explaining where his, his grandfather went off course and why he's fighting back to him. I know that you don't love the art like I do, but I love this chunky Batman fighting Ra's al Ghul with the martial arts and everything into it. There's this great splash page. It's very simple, but you get this big chunky Batman punching Ra's al Ghul, and, he, and it says, stay away from my son, which I thought was fantastic. He had a really, really awesome closing to this one. I love this issue. There's a epilogue at the end of this i believe that was pretty much unnecessary but everything before that was absolutely badass i think junie bob really nailed the landing it is a different art style than we're used to in western comic books but i really think it ended up encapsulating the character and the story that they were trying to tell and it definitely won me over big time this is an art style i'm i wasn't i haven't really been too familiar with recently you know but i did the best i could to really liken it to something else what i could compare it to that i liked in the past and the closest comparison i could come up with was samurai jack that am that, an that animation style of samurai jack was kind of similar to this how those characters are illustrated and i dug samurai jack back in the day so i could with that um with that connection, with that connection, I could go. I was going along with the art, and I was really digging it. And it was, hey, you know what? One small, small thing I enjoyed seeing was the Red Robin costume. I love seeing Tim Drake in that Red Robin. Yes, it was so great. It's been so long, and uh, yeah, I very action packed. I love how Batman looked in this. And uh, the only thing I couldn't go with was at the very end when uh, I don't know if we could talk about it, but when a certain character may come out of a, a certain pit, and how they may uh, not be. Brought to justice. It just, it, it, for me, it's just like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no. That's the only thing I couldn't go with. But other than that, yeah, I had, I had an absolute blast reading this. Yeah, definitely. If you haven't checked that one out, it's going to be one of those things that I think is going to pick up steam over time. Is going to be much more highly thought of, you know, in the years to come than maybe right now. And it sounds like it was picking up steam, but I think it's a brilliant, awesome look at Damian Wayne as a character. And I wish what we got at the end of this regarding Damian Wayne was the status quo for Damian moving forward to the DC Comics universe, where he was able to essentially resolve a lot of these conflicts that he had and move forward as a character, because every time they do with anything with Damian, they just regress him. And this feel, felt like they really tied all that stuff up and let him move forward, which is what I want with, with Damian. I just want some consistency at this point with Damien. Where where are we at with Damien in his mentality and his age? I, I don't I don't even know how old he's supposed to be right now because we are seeing everywhere he's supposed to be anywhere from what ten to eighteen years old now in the comics, depending on what you read. I, or he's either one of the smartest, capable kids, or he's one of the dumbest kids you're ever going to meet in the face of the earth. So I we need consistency. Absolutely, and that will wrap us up for the best of the week. I do want to say thank you very much to Drew for joining us. I hope you're ready for some football. It's opening weekend, but we had to get some comic book goodness in there before it all starts out. If you like this, what you would like something bigger, more complete, as in we talk about everything from Marvel, DC, and any comic books. If you want to support what we do on Think Critical YouTube, go over to Patreon. The doc is right here. You get the Hot or Not podcast with Jim from Weird Science, and we go two and a half hours to three hours every single week on all the new books from every publisher. If you haven't checked that out, there's a link in the video description. Hope to see you there.